Thanks for being here today. If you're new to our online campus, you need to know that we're a church that does our best to love like Jesus. We hope Door Creek Church will soon feel like home to you. Keep coming back. Now let's join our worship team as we sing our praises to God. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old may knew Jesus when I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that i'm breathing i have a future my eyes are open cause when you call my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name and i ran out of that grave
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a wonderful name it is nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus Last Sunday, Haiti, one of our global partners, experienced a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. 
Parts of the country are still recovering from the 2010 earthquake, and now they find themselves once again devastated. Just over a month ago, their president was assassinated in his home in the middle of the night. At the beginning of this week, Tropical Storm Grace rolled across the country. I fell in love with the people of Haiti three years ago on a mission trip. I find myself asking how much can they endure? I am reminded of God's word in Isaiah 41:13, For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. God is holding the people of Haiti tightly in his arms. They will make it through this because he is with them. You have an opportunity to love Haiti and give to the disaster relief efforts. You can use the link at the bottom of the screen. Thank you for continuing to lift them in prayer. Now here's Claire to share a little of what God is doing in and through Door Creek Church. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this weekend. God is working in big ways here at Door Creek Church, so make sure to check out our online bulletin at doorcreek.info. In the bulletin, you'll find a way to connect with us, give online, and see what's coming up at Door Creek Church. In the Connect tab, you'll have the ability to ask questions, learn about volunteer opportunities, share your story, submit a prayer request, or just let us know about your experience with us. We believe open communication between Door Creek Church attendees and staff is a vital part of growing together in Christ. Let's take a look at a few things happening right now. Door Creek Church believes groups are key to building meaningful relationships and growing closer to God. On September 12th and 19th, Group Up is happening at all Door Creek Church campuses following services. It's a great time to check out all new and open groups for you to join and get plugged in to all that's happening in and through Door Creek Church. Are you looking to grow closer to God and people with other like-minded women? We have two women's groups happening this fall. Beginning on September 9th, please join us on Thursday evenings at 6.30 as we dive into the Max Licato study, The God Who Knows Your Name. If Tuesday mornings work better for you, starting on September 14th, join us at 9 a.m. as we immerse in a study titled Anxious, Fighting Anxiety with the Word of God. To learn more or sign up, visit our online bulletin at doorcreek.com. Now let's open the scriptures together as we continue in our summer series, Watchdogs, the Minor Prophets. Hey, before we dive into our time of teaching, I want to give you a quick update and an opportunity. Uh, if you're still catching up with us here at Door Creek Church, who we are, uh, we just love extending Christ's compassion, extending his love as we become more devoted followers of Christ, uh, extending his, his mercy to, to others. And we do that in some really cool ways. We just finished a back to school drive and just overwhelmed by your generosity as we were able to just completely uh, uh, supply our seven partner schools in Madison and Sun Prairie and up in DeForest with school supplies. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Those of you who chose to give towards that uh, school supply drive. Also, just a quick update, our garden is approaching, if not already over by the time you're watching this, the 2,000 pounds of donated fresh produce to local food pantries to help uh, families uh, who, who just really need some fresh produce uh, in, their, in their houses, families families who, are, who may be in need. Uh, and we have thousands of pounds more that are going to be continued to be uh, harvested and, and given over the coming weeks. And, but we want to just continue to extend Christ's love and compassion, his justice and his mercy beyond, beyond our city. And one of the ways that we want to do that is with our global partner. Some of you may have caught up to this fact. Uh, maybe you've heard it on the news or you heard it from us last week. Our, our partners in Haiti, Haiti experienced this devastating earthquake. And we want to come around them uh, and just help and support them. We have a wonderful partner that we're working with, Mission of Hope. And we're going to take a special offering uh, today and this weekend, really throughout the rest of this week. We want to encourage you uh, to, to, to give to help the relief efforts that are needed as hundreds of our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, are without homes right now amongst many other uh, needs that they have because of the earthquake and 
and, and other things that are happening there with the political unrest. Uh, you can give in several ways. One, we just want to encourage you to give however you would normally give. And you can just uh, give online. We actually created a Haiti option for those of you that normally give online. Maybe you want to write a check uh, or mail in uh, something. That is, that is wonderful. Also, we set up a text to give. You can just text DCCMOH, which is Door Creek Church Mission of Hope, uh, to this number. And uh, if it's the first time, you might be asked to, to, to follow a prompt to set up, but you can just text DCCMOH with a space in the middle and then the amount that you'd like to donate. And uh, you can donate through text giving even right now. Uh, so we just want to encourage you uh, to do that in that way. Uh, also, we just want to address uh, that we are aware of what's happening in Afghanistan and the great need there as we are flooded with just horrifying images and video and hearing reports from other partners of ours, uh, of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in Afghanistan. And we're staying connected with our partners and how we might be able to come alongside them here in the near future. I wanna let you know it's probably in God's providence that we're actually about to launch something called the Refugee Response initiative here at our church here in Madison. And we learned this week that we already have uh, Afghanistan refugees coming to Madison. And so if you're interested at all in supporting the refugees here in Madison and those that will be coming this way, uh, head to our digital bulletin, doorcreek.info. There's a place to contact us uh, at the bottom and just in the notes uh, or in the comments, just write refugees. And we would love to connect with you there. But before before we dive into a message, I'd just like to, to offer a prayer and invite you to pray with me as we pray for our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ and for those uh, hundreds more people uh, in Haiti as well as in Afghanistan. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know that you are good and yet it is in times like this uh, when we just weep and we mourn with those who mourn, as the Apostle Paul says, at, at the devastation we see. In Haiti with the earthquake and those without homes and, and, and the, the hundreds that they're finding uh, who, who've lost their lives uh, and just so much more turmoil that's happening in Haiti right now. And our heart goes out to our brothers and sisters in Christ there as well as the many, many more. Uh, and we would just pray your providence uh, there that you would be glorified, that our efforts to come alongside our partners and the other good efforts that are happening their uh, Christ-centered efforts, uh, Father, that you would use those to your glory, that we would see lives uh, restored and renewed and hope being gained. And we also just want to extend that right now uh, to Afghanistan. And no matter, where, no matter where we stand on this issue, we can come together and just praying that the hope of Christ, your hope, the only hope that you can offer, that you would work in a mighty way there, that you would offer uh, safety and security in ways that uh, there, would, there doesn't seem to be. That for our brothers and sisters of Christ who are still in Afghanistan, that you would use them as great instruments of your love and your grace. Father, that, that we would be able to celebrate good reports of changed lives, even in this devastating, devastating situation. More importantly, we pray for physical safety for women and for children and for the Christians in Afghanistan. Uh, Father, as we just continue on in our time together, Father, help us to just remember that you are sovereign, that you are good, and just to be continually driven to our knees in prayer as we remember that those who are much less fortunate than us right now, may we take great confidence in you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
In the 1980s, a German taxi cab company wanted to see if they could lower their insurance costs uh, by reducing their accident rate. And so what they did with their taxi cab uh, companies, they, they installed, in half of their fleet, they installed ABS brakes. This is breaking new like safety technology at the time, right? Way back then in the, in the early 80s. And so their whole hope was just to lower accident rates. And so they installed it in half the fleet and sure enough, over time, accident rates increased. They didn't decrease at all. And so they're like, what is going on? We have this new safety feature. Why are accident rates not going down? And so they did like a secret shopper style where they hired passengers to observe the tax cab drivers. And when they observed the drivers, the drivers didn't know that the passengers were being paid to do that. And the passengers didn't know if they were in a taxi cab that had ABS brakes or did not have ABS brakes. And you can guess what they discovered. They discovered that those taxi cab drivers that had ABS brakes installed in their taxis took more risks on the road. Uh, and that's what led to even more accidents. And the auto industry has just uh, replicated this experiment again and again and again, finding the same thing, that the perceived measure of safety in our vehicles does not make us better drivers. It actually makes us worse drivers. Uh, and it's this uh, theory that some call risk homeostasis, where you adjust your behavior based on your perceived level of risk. If there's a low level of risk, your behavior will probably be risk and vice versa. It is this like, just kind of human concept, how we adjust our behaviors based on what we perceive that Zephaniah is speaking to when he writes to uh, Judah uh, here in his book, in his prophecy, chapter one, verse 12. Read this with me. At that time, so this is the Lord speaking, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are what? Who are complacent. Why are they complacent? Those who think the Lord will do nothing either good or bad. The Lord will do nothing either good or bad. The Israelites had this perception of who God was. He's not going to do anything good. And he's definitely not going to do anything bad. So what difference does it make? And they took it as a blank check that they could take to their spirituality and how they lived their lives. And they became complacent in their view of God, complacent in their faith. And it would lead to God's judgment. And so as we travel through this book together today, there's two questions, two questions that we're going to ask ourselves. The first is, what is your view of God that he can do neither good nor bad or that he can only do good and not bad or that he's just bad. What, what is your view of God? Secondly, a question that we'll ask is where might you be becoming complacent? But, but let's understand what's happening here in Zephaniah's time first before we move on. Now, the book of Zephaniah opens with the lineage of Zephaniah. And this is unusual. And what we learn is that he's of the lineage of King Hezekiah. Uh, who is King Hezekiah? Let's just rewind the clock a little bit. Uh, remember that the Israelites were in Egypt. God rescued them, right? Moses led them out of Egypt. They spent time in the wilderness. They finally made it into the promised land. And then after a while, uh, they were begging for a king and God said, okay. And they had King Saul. And then they had King David, who was a man after God's own heart. And then they had David's son, Solomon. And then after Solomon, I mean, and even really during Solomon's time, but definitely after Solomon, things really began to deteriorate. They separated into the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. 13 kings later in the Southern Kingdom, we call Judah, we have King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. Second Kings tells us this when it says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Uh, king Hezekiah was a good king. He reigned for 29 years, but then right after King Hezekiah, we have his son Manasseh. 
And uh, man, Manasseh, he was just not a good king. In fact, 2 Kings uh, tells us this about Manasseh, that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations of the Lord. The nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. See, Hezekiah kind of cleaned up everything. And when his son Manasseh came in, he, he reinstituted all these detestable practices, as the verse says. He was evil. In fact, he was so evil. We read on and we read this. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him, provoking the Lord to anger. Manasseh reigned for 55 years. And for 55 years, the Israelites were there. They were like, what's God doing here? We don't see anything good happening. We don't see anything bad happening. They became complacent. And after Manasseh had passed away after 55 years, his son Ammon uh, came into power and they had had enough. This is a really interesting story to read. There was a revolt. There was a coup. They overthrew him and his supporters and they put Ammon's son, into power, King Josiah. King Josiah became king at eight years old and he would be a great king. He would be an amazing king. In fact, chapter 23 in 2 Kings says this about King Josiah. It says, neither before nor after Josiah was there any king like him who turned to the Lord with what all of his heart and with all of his soul and with all of his strength, according to all the law of Moses. Josiah would bring great revival. Now, Zephaniah, many would say that Zephaniah prophesied before the great revivals of Josiah. Others would like to argue that it was actually after. No matter what, what's important is that it was during his reign that we have the prophecy of Zephaniah. And Zephaniah uh, gets to this. And it's this next verse we read in 2 Kings that really sets sets the tone. Right after saying that Josiah was the best there ever was, it says, nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away from the fury of his burning anger, which was kindled against Judah because of all that what? Because of all that Manasseh had done to provoke him to anger. And you get this sense that it doesn't matter how much Josiah would lead a revival. It was too late. It was, it was too late. The Israelites had become complacent. They had thought that the Lord could do neither good nor bad. Now it actually says in that verse too, they were like wine, like the dregs of wine. What are the dregs of wine? It's like the, like the solid bits that settle to the bottom of a bottle of wine after it's been open for a while. The dregs also can refer to just the solid bits of your tea. Like when it's been, when it's been there for a while, you don't want to drink that. Uh, or in your coffee maybe, like when you're just drinking your coffee, you don't want to finish it. You see the, the coffee bits at the bottom. It's been a metaphor for just the worst of the worst, the dregs of society. And he calls them the dregs. He says, because you think that God can do neither good nor bad. And the entirety of Zephaniah's book is all about this. It's all about the day of the Lord, which is, which is God's judgment. When God pours out his wrath, his jealous anger, as we're going to read about, Zephaniah spends the entirety of his book talking about the day of the Lord and is going to really challenge some of us to wrestle with this question of what is my view of God and how might I be becoming complacent? So what does Zephaniah say about the day of the Lord? Well, let's just dive in because he doesn't waste any time at all. Starting in verse two, he says, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. And this is called the reversal of creation. He, he's just walking backwards through the order of creation that we find in Genesis one. And he says, I'm going, to destroy. I'm going to destroy the earth. And he specifically talks then about the nation of Judah here, the Israelites. And 
<laughs> he says this about uh, what he's going to do. He says the Lord has prepared a sacrifice and he's consecrated those that he has invited. And he's saying, guys, I'm inviting you to this. And guess what? You're the ones that are going to be sacrificed. He doesn't hold anything back. And at the end of chapter one, when he's done talking about Judah, he says these words at the end of verse 18. He says, in the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed. For he will make a sudden end of all those who live on the earth. He talks about the destruction of the world. And he talks about the destruction of Judah. And he talks about the destruction of the world. And then in chapter two, he just starts lifting off, listing off the nations <laughs> that picked on Judah. He goes after Philistia. He goes after the Moabites and the Ammonites. He goes after the Cushites, the, the Egyptians. He goes after the Assyrians. And this is what he says when he says he's going to bring his judgment down on those nations for picking on his people. He says this in verse 11. He says, the Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of the earth. And that word awesome, it's this terrifying where you're paralyzed at the awful nature of God's wrath and his anger being poured out. And then in chapter three, he brings it back to Judah, but then focuses in on Jerusalem, his holy city. And we read these words. Of Jerusalem, I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her, but what? But they were still they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. And after talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, he will once again talk about the destruction of the entire world. When he says this at the end of verse eight, he says, the whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. My friends, what is your view of God? What is your view of God? Does your view of God allow, have room for a God of jealous anger, for a God of wrath? And as, as Zephaniah unpacks the day of the Lord, it forces us to wrestle with this nature of who God is. And we don't have all the time to, to, to accurately and, and just expound upon what it is, this jealous anger, this wrath of God. But I want to give us some handholds so that we have some, so, some uh, definition, at least some context as to what we're talking about. So when we talk about the wrath of God, the first thing that we want to talk about is that it's nothing to play around with. The wrath of God is nothing to play around with. Just note what we just read in chapter two, verse 11, how it is awesome, how it's just terrifying. It's paralyzing with fear. The wrath of God, it's nothing to play around with. We also know that it is now. Now Zephaniah is talking about how the, 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 the judgment of those nations, the judgment of Judah that's going to be happening eminently as Babylon's going to be coming in and wiping them out. But we also know the apostle Paul tells us that the wrath of God is being poured out now. Let's read this together in Romans 1. It says this, it says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So we know that the wrath of God is nothing to play around with. It's now, but thirdly, it's not just now, it's then. And we see this in the book of Zephaniah as he keeps pointing to this day in the future when God's going to pour out his wrath on the earth and wipe it all away, consumed by his jealous anger. Now, how can we help ourselves understand exactly what these prophecies mean and, and, and what they're doing here? I want to borrow an image from someone much smarter than me uh, who helps us understand this. And it's an image of a, a mountain uh, range. And we can help ourselves understand exactly what the prophets were doing uh, when we understand that the Lord gave them a certain perspective where they could see things that are going to be happening now, the immediate future, and then things that were going to be happening in later future, 
Uh, things, they couldn't see what was happening between then and now, uh, but they could see points in the future. And this is what Zephaniah is doing. Zephaniah is saying like right now, like you're going to be destroyed by Babylon. Judah, Jerusalem, Philistia, the Moabites, the Cushites, Assyria, you're all going to be destroyed and it's going to be through God's judgment. He's going to use Babylon as his instrument to do that. But then he keeps, he keeps pointing at this date in the future, this mountain peak in the future, the day of the Lord, God's judgment. So we see that God's wrath is nothing to play around with. It's happening now. It's also happening then. So fourthly, when we talk about God's judgment is it's focused on sin and evil. And we, this is really important to understand. God's judgment, his wrath, his jealous anger is not like ours. Ours is sinful. Some of us, man, we really struggle with anger and it can just, we can go off on anybody. That is not who God is. God's wrath, God's jealous anger is righteous. He is sovereign over all of it. It's focused on sin and focused on evil. The fifth thing that we must understand about God's wrath, just to give us a, a handhold, uh, a handle on kind of what we're talking about is that it's God's business, not ours. And this has everything to do with just God's sovereignty. It's God's sovereignty in our lives. It's God's sovereignty in the world that he is in complete control. Psalm 131 says, my eyes are not lifted up. My heart is not raised too high. I do not consider things too marvelous for me to understand. You see, we are not called to be instruments of God's wrath. Like some may want to take that, uh, that, that, that chalice up and be that person. That is not what God has asked us to be. Uh, that is God's business, not ours. He is in complete control. And so what has he asked us to do? What has God asked us to do? Well, Zephaniah, in the middle of talking about uh, all that uh, God is going to bring judgment on, he still brings the command for the faithful, the command for those who will be the remnant, a command for us so that we can have hope. And this is in Zephaniah 2 verse 3. Zephaniah 2 verse 3 says this. We can read it together. It says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. So those of you who are being obedient, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps, perhaps is, is a very interesting word here, isn't it? Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord. And you see in the middle of God's impending judgment and in the middle of, of the day of the Lord that is now and the day of the Lord that is then, our duty, our business as Christians has not changed and that we are to seek the Lord, that we are to be obedient, that we are to seek righteousness, that we are to seek humility. So as we understand God's wrath, one of the things that can help us understand this is an Oreo cookie. That's right. So I have here some Oreo cookies. I don't know about you, but I love Oreo cookies. Uh, we don't eat a lot of them for good reason because they won't last very long. You get a nice glass of milk. It's a good time. Now, there is an etiquette to eating an Oreo cookie. There are do's and there are don'ts. There's actually a lot of do's. There are a few don'ts. Have you ever seen someone take the top off the, the cookie, separate it from the cream, uh, scrape the cream off, put it on the plate, uh, put the two cookies together and eat it? They eat the Oreo without the cream. Like, what are you doing? Are you nuts? Like, that's not how you eat an Oreo cookie. Others of you, and I, I'm on to you, you take the top off and you lick off the cream, you put the cookie back together and you set it aside. And that's all you're after. I'm telling you, if that's you, just buy a can of a whipped cream and just eat it. Look, there is a right way to eat an Oreo cookie and that is to eat the cream with the cookie. Now what you can do is you can totally like combine them to make your own double stuff. Or if you have double stuff, you can make like a triple stuff. One time I tried to even make like a, a, a six layers of, of cream, but that was just, it just kind of fell apart. But anyways, look, you have to eat the cream with the cookie. That's how you eat an Oreo. 
Uh, Friends, as we come to our understanding of God, of who God is, and wrestling with this question of what is our view of God, some of us want the cookie without the cream. Some of us want a God who is so loving and merciful and he is those things, but we leave no room for his sovereignty in our lives. No room for the fact that he is a God of jealous anger as Zephaniah describes. Job helps us understand this when he says in chapter two, uh, verse 10, when he says, what are we supposed to do? Like just accept the good things of God, but not, not the trouble that he brings? Like, wait, what do you mean God brings trouble. Well, God is in complete control of all things. Uh, Paul in the gospel of Romans, and then also uh, in the book of second Peter, the apostle Peter helps us understand this, that God is in control, that God sets the authorities of the world in place. They don't come together on their own. God sets them in place. And they actually tell us in both Romans and in second Peter that we're to obey the authority that we're under, which is kind of hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Especially lately, if you live in Dane County. When Jesus Christ was being offered to the mob, he turned to Pontius Pilate and he says, you're only here because my father wanted you here. My friends, God is in complete control. Isaiah 45, seven. Isaiah 45, seven is a very troublesome verse for some because he says, I created the light and I formed the darkness. I bring prosperity. And it says this, I create disaster. And it's one of the most important for verses for us to understand that we cannot have the cookie without the cream. That in our view of who God is, we must understand his wrath in connection with his love. And that is the most important part as we understand God's wrath, get a handle on it. And that is the sixth thing is that it's connected to his love. It's connected to his love. God's wrath is connected to his love. God's jealous anger is connected with his his grace-filled mercy. You, You cannot have the cream without the cookie. You cannot have the cookie without the cream. What is your view of God? Is there room in your view of God for a God who's in complete control, even though you may not understand exactly what he's doing? Is there room for your view of God, for a God who may cause trouble in your life? That's right, cause trouble in your life so that you can become a more devoted follower of him, even though you may not understand his ways because they're too great and too marvelous. Is there room in your view of God for a God of jealous anger? What is your view of God? You cannot have the cookie. You cannot have the cookie without the cream. And you say, Mark, that's great. Zephaniah really hammers home this day of the Lord thing. It's a bit of a downer. (laughs) I'm glad you tried to brighten it up by talking about Oreo cookies, but let's be honest, God's wrath is a bit of a downer. And you're right. You can't have the cookie without the cream. And that's one of the beautiful things about the book of Zephaniah is that it gives us both because what Zephaniah does in chapters three, verse nine through the end of the chapter, verse 20, is he paints this beautiful picture of a loving, merciful God who provides for us. Let's read this together. We have to read it because it's so, it is so good. Starting in verse nine, he says this, then I will purify the lips of the peoples that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. So we have this perfect unity as a brother and sisterhood of Christ from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings on that day. You, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for the wrongs that you have done to me because I have, I will remove from you your arrogant posters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you what? The meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. And Zephaniah is painting this beautiful picture 
about how on the day of the Lord, there is God's wrath being poured out. But then on the other side of God's wrath is this beautiful love and mercy and unity and perfectness. I'm not sure if that's a word, but it, it is right now. Perfectness. And he doesn't stop there. He continues, sing daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Daughter, Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Can you imagine the world without fear or the perfect unity? Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong between us. We are perfectly living out what it means to be true brothers and sisters in Christ. On that day, man, that's a great three words. On, underline that in your Bible or highlight it if you're on your phone. On that day, verse 16, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. He's talking about on that day, what the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. His love, he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice over you with singing. And he continues to go on. I will remove, says the Lord, that I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which was a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land that they have suffered shame. And at that time, I will gather you. At that time, what? I will bring you, what does it say? I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I, when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes. What a beautiful picture. You say, yes, that is the God that I love. That is the reward that we have waiting for us on that day. So if that is our reward that is waiting for us, how come we find ourselves like the Israelites complacent? dregs in the wine thinking that God's not going to do anything. Uh, in 2020, <laughs> we were one of those families who bought a dog. <laughs> we bought a dog. And in talking about buying a dog, uh, you know, I had just a few stipulations. Now, my wife had, Cassie had things that she wanted, and I had things that I wanted. She wanted a smaller dog than a larger dog so we could still travel and, and do some other things that we'd like to do that a smaller dog would make possible. And I said, fine, but I want a manly dog, okay? I don't want no foo-foo dog. I don't want no foo-foo dog name. I want to be proud walking this dog around the block. And I know I'm speaking to some male stereotypes here, and I'm okay with that because that's just how I felt and what I said at the time. And so no foo-foo dog, no foo-foo name, but it's okay if it's small. And so this is what we got. Yep. And uh, the kids named her and uh, they named her Lulu. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, uh, all my demands were clearly met. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay with it too, totally. No, really, we love the dog. Uh, she's been a great part of the family. You know, what do you do? She, we just celebrated her first birthday. So here she is with all the kids. Obviously, when your dog turns one, you buy donuts for everyone else in your family but the dog because that's how you celebrate a dog's birthday, right? That's just what you do. They love her. And this is me just having to constantly remind myself, I own a mini golden doodle named Lulu. I still have to tell myself. <laughs> I own a mini golden doodle named Lulu. No, she's a great dog. Uh, look, if you've ever trained a dog or if you've ever had to train any pet of any kind, you know that training a pet involves immediate reward for good behavior. All right, so you bring treats with you. You have those ready at any time so that when they do something you want them to do, you immediately reward them so that they, so that they know to repeat that behavior. And so that's how we trained our dog. And, and uh, honestly, that's how we're trained as humans too, isn't it? <laughs> we're not that much different. We've figured out what the reward is and our behaviors are adjusted to make sure that we get what we want. So often, we don't see the reward that's directly in front of us. 
like Zephaniah pointing to a day on that day, a day way off in the future that can be our mindset of our reward for being a follower of Christ. And it changes how we behave. We become complacent because we think in the meantime, what's God going to do? Good, bad? I don't see it happening anywhere. What's he possibly going to do? And what we miss is the fact that our reward is immediate. It's not just in the future, it's now. In Zephaniah, 2 verse, in Zephaniah 2, verse 3, when he says, seek the Lord, you humble the land. Those of you who, he says, obey, right? Those of you who obey, seek what? Seek righteousness, seek humility. Who has become our righteousness? As 1 Corinthians says, Christ has. Who has humbled himself so that we can become rich. It's Jesus Christ. Let's look at this verse. Uh, Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord your God is in your midst. He's with you. Where does Jesus say he's with us? In Matthew 28, 20, in the Great Commission, he says, behold, I am with you always. We have that already. It's an immediate reward. The mighty one who will save. Isaiah 63, verse one, talks about the coming Christ. And he said, he is the mighty one who will save. Christ is the mighty one who will save. Uh, he will rejoice over you with gladness in the gospel of Luke. What does Jesus tell us? But that every time a sinner repents, there's a party in heaven. He's rejoicing over us now. He'll quiet you by his love. And it just reminds us of Psalm 23, just painting this beautiful picture of who Christ is as our shepherd. What? Helping us lie down in green pastures and quiet waters and what refreshing, restoring our soul. And he will exalt over you with loud singing. Some of us just need to be encouraged today in our view of God, that our God is in our midst. Our God is with us now. We have that now. That's not just something that's gonna happen in the future, but because of Christ, we have that now. Some of us need to be encouraged in our view of God, that a mighty one who will save is a mighty one who does save, who has saved. Maybe he's waiting for you so that he can save you. But for many of us, we can relish in the salvation that we have in Christ. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Do you know that Christ rejoices over you with gladness? Uh, he will quiet you by his love. Are you feeling the refreshing restoration, love of Christ and how it quiets us and how we can rest by still waters even now, no matter what's happening in the world, he will rejoice over you with loud singing. You know, that's, a, that's something that's hard for us to understand even in our first world context because, because maybe you have a great parents growing up or a great spouse or a great friend or a great coach who's just really good at encouraging you and lifting you up. Friends, it fails in comparison. It pales in comparison uh, to what God is doing right now, how he's rejoicing over you. And maybe you're feeling limited because of your circumstances. Maybe you're just lying on the couch wondering when, uh, when you'll be able to get a job. Maybe you're lying in a cell wondering when you might get out. Maybe you're wondering what's going to be happening in your marriage in the coming future. Maybe you're wondering what the doctor is going to say. Uh, perhaps you're wondering what your spouse uh, is going to say. Uh, maybe like us, you're wondering what the orthodontist is going to say. We just need to be encouraged. Our God is with us. Our God is mighty to save. He rejoices over us with gladness. He delights in us. He restores our soul. He quiets us with his love, this restorative nature of his love. And he rejoices over us with singing. What is your view of God? What is your view of God? And when we talk about an Oreo and how you can't have the cookie without the cream, man, the book of Zephaniah is just a beautiful foreshadow of the gospel itself because he talks about the judgment of the Lord, the day of the Lord, and the wrath that God have, has and will have. And then on the other side of it, he talks just about the incredible life that we'll have with Christ because of God's uh, judgment, because of the day of the Lord. And what a beautiful, 
beautiful foreshadow of the gospel that on the cross we have God's wrath being poured out on Jesus Christ and then in the resurrection of Christ we have his incredible love and mercy and forgiveness. What is your view of God? For some of us, we really need to wrestle with that this week. What is your view of God? For others of us, we need to wrestle with that second question I said at the beginning of our time together. Where may we have been, where, where might have we become complacent? Maybe it's because we don't see the reward we have now with Christ. Maybe it's because we're letting our circumstances decide whether we think God is good or bad or, or, or whatever. Where might you be complacent in your spiritual life? And let us just be encouraged by the same words Zephaniah said to the nation of Judah in chapter 2, verse 3. Because they're true for us now. Seek the Lord you humble of the land. Those of you who do what he commands, seek righteousness. Seek humility. Let's pray together. So Heavenly Father, uh, just help us grow in our understanding of who you are and let the, your word, the Bible, define that for us so that we cannot be complacent so that we can grow in all the areas of our life that you would have us to grow in so that we can become more devoted followers of Christ. So that we can seek you, being found humble and obedient, seeking righteousness and seeking humility. May we be found in your favor this week because of Christ because he's the mighty one who saves, the one who is with us, because you're rejoicing over us, quieting us with your love. Thank you for all of this. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Such a great message. Remember to pray about taking that next step into community at Group Up next month. We can't extend Jesus' love to others if we aren't intentionally moving closer to him. We love you and can't wait to see you next week.